let's get our guest Andy Jacobs up here. Andy is someone who I, I've known for a long time, and I have just an immense amount of respect for for a lot of reasons. But I, I'm I'm really honored to talk to him today, not just about his primary uh, area of expertise as a as a petitioner that is a signature gatherer, but uh, about the bigger picture that we're facing as well. We're also going to get into, of course, some of his recent stories about. <clears throat> challenges under Corona and, and things that the Libertarian Party are facing. But to give him his, his proper introduction to, to someone who's been an activist with the Libertarian Party for a long time, he, he's not just a, you know, boots on the ground petition gatherer, but a, a real ballot access expert. He has personally gathered over 90,000 petition signatures just in his work to get LP candidates on the ballot. But he's also gotten tens of thousands for other initiatives, uh, referendums, things like that. Sometimes being a hired gun, but never in violation of libertarian principles. He's worked on ballot access drives in 35 states. He was active with the Ron Paul campaign in 2008 and 12. And in 2012, he was the ballot access coordinator for Ron Paul's campaign. Andy, thank you for, uh, for giving us your time today. I really appreciate you joining the show. How are you doing, brother? Hi, hey, I'm doing good. Can, oh, you, can you see me and hear me well? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Um, I'm yeah. in a car, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Man, I, I know, and I appreciate you making the effort, too, because uh, this is certainly an interesting time of challenge. But um, I think before we get into the bigger picture or your recent challenges, why don't you tell us first uh, about how, how you've spent this election cycle? Um, well, I've spent a lot of this election cycle uh, gathering petition signatures to place, uh, you know, Libertarian Party candidates on the ballot and uh, um, some pro-liberty ballot initiatives on the ballot. So, um, and uh, of course, except when we were prevented from doing it because of the uh, whole uh, COVID thing, when things got really, uh, really crazy and uh we a lot a lot of petition drives around the country actually shut down for a couple months or so. I but, believe the last uh, yeah. time I, saw, I believe the last time I saw you in person was at the Illinois uh, Libertarian State Convention. Is that right? Uh, no, no, it was uh, California. <clears throat> California. Okay, you were at the California one. And for those of you who, who have been to uh, state conventions, you might recognize Andy as the guy who had Libertarian gatherings as like walking around with an armload full of petitions being like can i get your signature well then quick take two minutes sign all these two and and getting you on you know to to, to help him out and to help out all these causes that he's involved in um but you were who are you gathering signatures for and and how did you get shut down and what kind of efforts have you been involved with since the i don't, I don't know since since the virus got here uh, well well, what was I gathering signatures for, for for when when the uh, when things got crazy with COVID or or, yeah. or uh, uh, well, I was actually in California. I, I was in California at the time uh, doing some uh, ballot initiatives, and uh, like I said, things got crazy with COVID, and so it shut down. And uh, then I re that that was in March. That was around late March, and then it restart. I you know, um, some petition drives started restarting actually in in May. And, um, you know, I, in June, I, uh, I went to Nebraska and I worked on a medical marijuana initiative and a casino gaming initiative. So that was the first thing I did, you know, uh, after the COVID shutdowns. And, uh, interestingly in Nebraska, um, I would say well, it was like maybe 70 to 80% of the people in Nebraska were not wearing masks. And um, for everybody out there that's, you know, paranoid about the whole COVID thing, I, I think it's been uh, wildly exaggerated. Um, well, you know, we'll get the, back to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but most of the people in Nebraska were not wearing masks. And so uh, we were able to get signatures and qualify, you know, a medical marijuana initiative and a casino gaming initiative uh, for the ballot. I know they did have enough signatures to make the ballot. I, I think there were challenges on the legal language of the petition, not on the petition signatures. So uh, I'm not sure what the status of that is. But after that was over, uh, I uh, went to the Libertarian Party National Convention in Orlando. And then I went on the road and petitioned for the Libertarian Party in uh, Wisconsin and Iowa. And so uh, 
then I've done some other things, you know, since then. And then uh, I'm actually back in California right now working on a statewide uh, referendum uh, to repeal a bill that uh, the governor recently signed that bans flavored tobacco products, you know, for vaping, for cigarettes, for uh, um, uh, it also includes flavored rolling paper. All of this stuff got banned. And uh, the bill is kind of hypocritical because uh, it exempted expensive cigars, pipe tobacco, and right. uh, so you know, yeah. the, the rich people can still have their their stuff, you know, because a lot of that, you know, is smoked by by uh, wealthier people. Not all, but a lot of it. But uh, they heck with everybody else. So uh, anyway, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And uh, you know, it's for the Libertarian Party. Uh, the Libertarian Party is going to be on the ballot in all 50 states uh, plus Washington D.C. And uh, Joe Jorgensen is the only uh, minor party, third party, whatever we call it, or independent. She's technically not an independent, but they often lump independents in with minor parties. Uh, candidate who's going to be on the ballot in all 50 states plus uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, now let me just dispel a little uh, a, a ballot access myth. A lot of people don't understand ballot access. OK, going into the election cycle, the Libertarian Party already had ballot access in a lot of states. So it's not like the Libertarian Party necessarily has to petition every state during every election. Uh, the Libertarian Party came into this year already having ballot access in something like 15 or, or uh, 40, uh, uh, 35 states, something, uh, some, somewhere around there. And um, also, a lot of the ballot access work is not done by the presidential campaign. Most of it is done by the LNC, the Libertarian National Committee, or by the state parties. Um, and ballot access is pretty complicated. It's you got to look at each state's laws and it's very complicated. And I remember in the last election uh, when when Gary Johnson was running, there was this kind of rumor floating around or misconception that, well, if Gary Johnson gets five percent of the vote, that'll get us uh, ballot access nationally. That's not true. That's not true. Every state has different ballot access laws. And, you know, some states like, uh, for instance, uh, Pennsylvania, um, Joe Jorgensen could carry Pennsylvania. She could win the state, you know, and, and, and get the electoral college votes. And the Libertarian Party still wouldn't have ballot access in Pennsylvania because in Pennsylvania, all candidates for every office have to petition their way on the ballot, even the Democrats and Republicans, including their presidential candidates. So uh, in Pennsylvania, the only way to get uh, uh, recognized uh, major party status is you would have to get 15 percent of the electorate which would come out to like over 800,000, maybe 900,000 people to register to vote under the Libertarian Party banner. That would be checking off the Libertarian box on their voter registration form. And uh, that's extremely difficult to do that. And then the only thing you'd win is you'd have major party status. You would get a primary. Then you would have to collect signatures to put the candidates on the ballot in the primary. So uh, some states have you can get on the ballot through a number of voter registrations. That is people registering to vote and putting Libertarian on their voter registration. Uh, now, half the states don't register by party. About half of them do, about half of them don't. Um, and then um, some states have where if you get a certain percent of the vote uh, for, for a statewide office, it's usually governor, could be president, or could be another statewide office, then you can retain ballot access through that. But um, another, another myth was that, um, that the, the Gary Johnson vote total got the Libertarian Party ballot access in, in every state. And that wasn't true either. They picked up through Gary Johnson's vote total. It got the Libertarian Party ballot access. And I think it was like five or six states that they were able to retain ballot access off the 2016 presidential vote. But in some of those states, it, it was it's a little bit complicated. Like one state they did that in was Connecticut. So Gary Johnson got over a certain percent of the vote. I think it was 1% of the vote in Connecticut. But all that did was it got the party ballot access for president only in Connecticut. Didn't get the party ballot access for every office. So libertarians in Connecticut running for offices other than president would still had had to have petitioned uh, this year. So anyway, bottom line, the ballot access laws are, are, are pretty uh, pretty complicated. And, and um, a lot of people don't understand that. Check the laws in your state, if you, you know what I mean. So anyway. well, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get too sucked down into those technicalities because that's <clears throat> that's part of how you get screwed. And I, I think it's enough for people to appreciate that one of the ways the duopoly keeps libertarian candidates off the ballot is by 
having you jump through complicated hoops where it's, you know, and we brought you the story uh, just a few days ago where also in Nebraska, there was a massive, uh, that, that, that cannabis effort to get uh, medical uh, or to get cannabis uh, the initial, yeah. uh, on, on the ballot. And it was uh, defeated by a legal effort that was funded anonymously. And yeah, well, that, oh, oh, by the way, that didn't have anything to do with the actual signatures. They did have enough valid signatures to be on the ballot. Yeah. They did a challenge on the language, the wording of the petition. And yeah, so, so yeah, well, that's there's a whole other level. Work. Exactly. There's a whole other, thank you. No, there's a whole other level of tragedy where this incredible effort was invested in gathering something like 170,000 something signatures when they only needed 122,000 and they still got kicked off the ballot essentially. And yeah, that's yeah, what happened. Yeah, it had to do with the wording of the uh, of the petition. And uh, ballot initiative petitions are actually kind of a bit more complicated than a, a party or candidate petition. But um, yeah, there was actually something uh, similar that happened to the Libertarian Party in Ohio back in the early 2000s where they did a petition drive and they had a certain legal language on the petition. And it turned out they that the state had just changed the wording of the uh, party status petition in Ohio. They just altered it very yeah. slightly. And I guess somebody in the LP of Ohio didn't know that. And so they were using uh, a form from like the previous election. And that was used to knock the LP off the ballot in Ohio. This was back in, oh, geez, I think it was maybe 2002 or something like that. But uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, ballot access laws are complicated. Now, um, yeah, they're, and, and they're sometimes they're too difficult. I mean, sometimes they're definitely uh, too complicated, too anal. But um, I will say there's sort of somewhat of a silver lining uh, to that uh, for the Libertarian Party this year, and that is that um, th this year the Libertarian Party presidential candidate has the least competition it has ever had mm. from other minor party and independent candidates. Yes, um, having ballot access because usually there, you know, there might be somebody else like a like a Ross Perot or something who will get on the ballot in all 50 states plus D.C. or, or Ralph Nader. Now, Nader never got on all 50 states plus D.C. ballot, but he came close. He got, you know, well into the 40s, maybe 45 states, 46 states, something like that. Um, right. uh, uh, Jill Stein, who was the Green Party candidate in 2012 and 2016, in yeah. the last election, she was on the ballot in 44 states plus Washington, D.C., and Gary Johnson got on in all 50 plus DC in, in 2016. Okay, well, this year, the closest competitor to Joe Jorgensen is Green Party candidate Howie Hawkins. He's only going to be on the ballot in 29 states uh, oh. plus DC. And then after Rocky De La Fuente, I mean, I'm sorry, not Rocky, after, after Howie Hawkins, all the other candidates that are running for president, I'm, I believe, are on the ballot in like less than 20 states or maybe 20 states at the most but you know there's a guy named rocky de la fuente i think he's on the ballot in i don't know maybe 17 18 maybe 20 states something like that uh, uh brock pierce he's an independent candidate and a, and, and a bitcoin guy somebody known in the bitcoin world he's yeah. only on the ballot in like 17 states or something 18 you know there's a, a, a don blankenship constitution party he only made it on the ballot in 18 states and there's like a, a, a kanye west yeah kanye uh, west that's that's be on the ballot like so anyway basically there are 12 states where joe jorgensen is the only alternative to donald trump and and um, Joe Biden, 12 yeah. states. And those 12 states are New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Georgia, <laughs> Alabama, Indiana. I, I'm not uh, going to remember uh, all of them. Arizona. Okay, well, I'll just, I might as well finish it. Montana, <laughs> North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. So in those states, Joe Jorgensen is the only alternative candidate on the ballot. And that's going to be really big for the Libertarian Party. So yeah, this I, is... I, I, Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm guessing you can rattle off all those names is that you're familiar with the struggle in all of those states and why even Howie Hawkins and the Green Party, as organized as they are, failed to get on those 12 ballots. Yeah, interestingly enough, with the Green Party, uh, part of their problem was uh, paranoia over COVID. There were a lot of Greens that just didn't want to go out and collect signatures or didn't think you could collect signatures because of COVID. And I'll tell you what, if the Libertarian Party had taken that same attitude, which some people in the party actually were, but fortunately, 
there were enough of them who weren't that we actually went out and did it and get the job done. Because if we hadn't gone out and worked, besides, you know, in spite of all this COVID hysteria, then, you know, Joe Jorgensen would not be on the ballot in all 50 states plus D.C. Well, so that, that brings me back to what I want to ask you about before. You said you were in Nebraska and that in Nebraska, 80 percent of the people on the street weren't wearing masks. And, and I assume you're I mean, t- you can tell us about the kinds of uh, venues where you're gathering signatures, events or outside of grocery stores, you know, down to that level of specifics, please. But you said you were uh, also well, gathering. Well, you said you were also gathering signatures in in Ohio and w- in one other state in California. How did they all compare? Oh, well, um, no, I was not in Ohio this time. Uh, I was in Ohio a few years ago. But uh, anyway, yeah, the LP actually already had ballot access in Ohio, by the way, so they didn't have to petition this time. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, so Nebraska, out of the states I've been in this year, had the least paranoia about COVID. Um, I was also in, you know, Wisconsin and Iowa. It was a bit more paranoid. And and California is also uh, uh, more paranoid about uh, about COVID. Now, um, um, interestingly enough, while I was petitioning over the summer in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, they have a beach there that's on the shores of Lake Michigan. I actually ran into somebody on the beach who was a news reporter with uh, uh, Spectrum News, and it's a TV station. And uh, they interviewed me. I, I've sent out that video. Um, Adam might have watched it. I don't know. But, there, but there's a video of me uh, uh, gathering signatures on the beach and i'm interviewed by this reporter and on the beach i would say 90 percent of the people were not wearing masks Mm -hmm. on the beach but if you went into a store in wisconsin in wisconsin then yeah at the stores they were telling you you couldn't go in the store if you didn't have a a mask on so um but but on the beach it's kind of funny that most of the people having having fun on the beach were not wearing masks now uh, oddly enough i did bring a mask with me but i had it down most of the time like like down around here and right. um, when the news reporter interviewed me, now she was not wearing a mask either, um, but she thought it would be a good idea. It would look good for the camera if I put the mask up. And so I put it up for the news story, you know, maybe I, whether I should have done that or not. But she no. thought it would look good. Oh, man. Yeah, You're I, like, did, I did. I did. I did. Well, I put it up. Are, but it was so mostly you, for so show. You, so, you, so, so this was, this was similar to, you know, what my position would be like, you know, if I was knocking on doors as a candidate or gathering signatures and, you know, just as a customer in stores that I'll never wear it proactively. But I, I usually have, a, and, and, you know, sometimes I don't have one on me, but I usually have uh, a bandana. And if someone asks and says specifically to come into my private business or to come into this government facility that you have to do or we're going to steal from you. The only way is if you wear a mask, I would. So you're wearing a mask to, sh- to show that you're willing to, but you had it off most of the time. Would people ask you to put it on to sign um, your some, some Some people did. Um, and then some of them, I just saw them wearing a mask. So I figured I better put mine up, you know, so I was just kind of reading the crowd as I went. But I'll tell you, most of the time when I was on the in the beach area in Wisconsin, I had the mask down. Uh, probably, like I said, probably 90% of the people weren't wearing masks. So probably I had the mask down, you know, like 90% of the time. And yeah. So then <laughs> it, it's not, yeah. So it's not that just that they were at the beach hanging out by the water without masks. They were comfortable approaching you with, with your mask down. I, I think this is a r- really important, you know, w- what you're giving our audience now as an insight to the texture of coronaphobia, where we are with it, where we are with masks, masks right now, you know, and, and I, I mean, I've been saying it for, for quite a while that it, it's largely symbolic. Like if, you know, if I, there were a couple of times I went shopping with my wife and she was like, Adam, if they ask you at the entrance, you're going to put on a mask in this store. And I'm like, all right, if it's important to you and I would put on the mask and then pull it down to my chin. And nobody said anything. And I was just ready to tell, well, like, aren't we just doing this symbolically? And it's like, yeah, even for most people, even though they're kind of zombies walking into this. But, uh, Andy, can you can you help? I don't know. Well, I guess before we move on, you said you had one story that you really wanted to share um, about about getting harassed by authorities and that this is something that petitioners for Libertarian Party can't. Well, Petitioners in general, but especially libertarians, that, that they deal with uh, on a regular basis, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, frankly, you can be harassed if you're doing any petition for anything, even if it was for. Uh, it could be you could be doing a petition uh, for 
Donald Trump or Joe Biden or something and and uh, and be harassed. So um, now you may be more likely to get harassed if you're doing something that the people in government don't like. Um, but yeah, you could get harassed doing any petition. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, I you know, uh, the thing is, you know, which time I've been harassed so many times, it's uh, it's hard to keep track of them. <laughs> it's probably yeah. I probably had the cops called on me. Oh, geez. I it, it, maybe 200 times or something. Now I've only gotten arrested twice. Um, and that might say only got arrested twice. Well, you know, any, most people who've done a lot of petition signature gathering have been arrested at least one time. So it's almost like a badge of honor. It's almost a little right. bit unusual. You don't get arrested. But anyway, I got arrested for petitioning in, um, in, uh, uh, Maryland back in, uh, 2010. And I got arrested in Arkansas in 2015. And uh, both times I was petitioning for the uh, Libertarian Party. And uh, in Maryland, I was gathering signatures in front of a public library. And uh, now the funny thing is, myself and another guy were gathering signatures. It was in uh, it was a place called Howard County, Maryland, which is, uh, you know, in between uh, 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 D.C. and uh, Baltimore. And uh, anyway, um, we had gathered signatures at another in another city in that same county. And not had any problems. The cops saw us there, didn't say anything. Uh, we actually ran into the head librarian of the county library system, and, and she acknowledged that we had a right to do it. So I went to a library that was in the same county, but maybe 10 miles away from this other library. And um, they said I couldn't do it, blah, blah, blah. They called the cops. The cops came out. I tried to talk to them. I said, hey, I'd like to talk to whoever is in charge. They said, well, the sergeant's coming out. The sergeant came out. And I usually will carry some papers that will have some relevant court rulings or statutes on it or something that indicate that we have a right to gather signatures in such and such location. And right. the sergeant wouldn't look at anything. He wouldn't listen to what I had to say. Told me I had to leave. And um, I asked if they could put it in writing. They wouldn't give me anything in writing. So I pulled out my phone. I said, okay, I'll leave, but I want to record you telling me to leave because I think this is an illegal command and I'm going to, you know, hand the footage over to a, a, an attorney. Right. And uh, the cop grabbed me. He started sh trying to rip the phone out of my hand like this. Okay. I didn't want my phone to fall on the concrete ground and, and break. And um, so uh, then the second cop grabbed me. I was trying to put the phone back in the case so it didn't get smashed. Okay. I was right. just getting the phone back in the case and the first cop goes behind his back pulls out a can of mace and then sprayed me in the eyes with it. Wow. So I was, yeah. Then they put me in handcuffs, put me in leg cuffs. I was taken to jail and I sat in jail for like eight hours. They charged me with false charges. And uh, fortunately in that situation, I was uh, fortunate enough to get some help from the uh, ACLU mm. and uh, they, they got all the charges got thrown out. Now, unfortunately, I was never in a position to do anything about it. And uh, I unfortunately didn't get any help from anyone in the Libertarian Party. And uh, that's very, very disappointing to me. But, uh, yeah, all the charges got dropped. And then uh, I got I got arrested in Arkansas for, for gathering signatures at uh, 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 Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. And in that situation, uh, I had gathered signatures at this university in, in, uh, uh, in 2011. And there was another person with me. We were there for a few days. They never said a word to us. We never had any problems, nothing. And uh, we probably got like a thousand signatures there. Okay. Well, anyway, then um, I went back to the same university a couple of years later and um, I was getting signatures. Everything was going well. And they said, oh, you have to stand in a free speech zone. <laughs> and the free speech zone is designed to put you in a location where you can't talk to anybody. So um, I was in a busy spot on the campus uh, and I was getting, oh, geez, I was doing pretty good. I think I was getting like 30, 40, 50 signatures an hour. Well, when they moved me to the free speech zone, which was there was hardly any foot traffic there and it was near a construction site. So I was having to shout whenever anybody walked by uh, because of the construction noise. It dropped my signatures down to like maybe seven signatures an hour. Mm -hmm. So um, in Arkansas, we were actually fortunate. Now, the ACLU typically is so backlogged with cases that they don't have time to take every case that comes along. But uh, we were, and so we usually don't get any help from the ACLU. They usually do nothing. But in Arkansas, we were lucky enough to get some help with the ACLU. And they had contacted some other colleges in Arkansas that were giving us problems, and those colleges backed down. So I thought, well, I'm going to try it here. So I contacted our contact person at the ACLU. They contacted the college. The college refused to back down. 
they were, you know, this, no, no, you got, you can only do it if you're in this free speech. Zone. So I ended up leaving Jonesboro. The situation was unresolved. I came back two years later, another petition drive for the Libertarian Party. And I went back to that college. Now, in the interim, I had found out there had been some court cases that had gone our way in other states where colleges got sued over the free speech zone issue. And uh, some of those states were in the vicinity of Arkansas. And so I figured, well, maybe these, this college got the, uh, maybe they've got the memo now that, you know, you're supposed to allow free speech on college campuses. So I went back and I figured, well, the worst thing they'll tell me to do is to stay in a free speech zone. Okay. Well, unfortunately I was wrong. They told me I couldn't be anywhere on the campus, like that you could not collect any signatures anywhere on the campus. And so I was saying, you know, well, hey, we're supposed to have a right to do this. And I, uh, anyway, long story short, the cop, um, told me they wrote me out a trespass citation and uh i said i was holding the trespass citation i was about to leave the campus and i just said okay um i think this is an illegal trespass citation but i'm going to leave the campus now but i do intend to show this citation to an attorney and if the attorney concurs that this is an illegal trespass citation i may return to the campus to collect signatures at a future date well not long after i said that the cops, without giving me any warning or anything, grabbed me by both arms. One of the cops bent my arm back in a position to like practically break it. And um, uh, they put me in handcuffs and I was locked in jail. And they, they took me to jail and I was, I, I was in jail in Arkansas for like two days. And um, they charged me with a bunch of false stuff. And, uh, you know, once again, disappointedly, nobody in the Libertarian Party, uh, you know, stepped forward to help me. But, you know, within it took like a year and a half to get the charges dropped, but they did eventually get dropped. And uh, actually, there's been a little bit of good news in Arkansas since then. The governor of the state, uh, who's a Republican, actually signed a bill saying uh, specifically uh, uh, saying that the colleges in Arkansas have to allow free speech. Now, I don't think he did it out of principle. I don't think he did it to help libertarians, certainly. But I think he did it because, um, you know, college campuses are generally, you know, very left wing, very Democrat. And uh, Republicans right. were actually having yeah. problems on uh, on college campuses in Arkansas. I know the group. Uh, what's that group with that guy? Uh, what's his name? Charlie Kirk. Uh, Turning Point USA. Turning Point. Right. USA. They actually were getting run off of uh, college campuses. So anyway, um, yeah, you can get hassled a lot. I mean, just recently here in California, um, I was run out of a location that I've gotten signatures at before in California, including just a few months ago. And the cop used the excuse of COVID to run me out of the location. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you're supposed to have a right to do this, but uh, uh, your rights have been suspended because of COVID. So uh, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a battle. It's a battle. That's one of the toughest things about ballot access is actually being able to go out and, and find places where you can talk to the public. Because if you can't talk to people, um, you, you know, you're not going to get enough signatures to get on the ballot. Now, you can go door to door petitioning. And I've done a lot of that where you're knocking on doors in neighborhoods. But there's some, you know, there's some limitations to that because, you know, most people aren't home Monday through Friday, you know, until like, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, you can't knock on anybody's door past nine o'clock at night. And um, also, uh, you know, there's some people who live in gated gated communities or they have fences around their house or yeah. they're in a locked apartment or condo. So you can't, some, somebody else say, well, just go knock on doors. Well, there's, you can do that, but there's, there's limitations to that. So, so uh, Andy, and, Andy I, yeah. oh yeah, well, I want to go back. Uh, you said you had the cops called on you 200 times. So <clears throat> what are the, what are the complaints usually? Just like there's a guy loitering, collecting signatures or yeah, yeah, yeah. customers or what yeah. they, they, and then a cop comes out and says, What's going on? You're just like, nothing I don't have a right to do. And they leave you alone most of the time, right? Um, no, no, they don't leave you alone most of the time. Uh, most of the time, they'll threaten you with arrest and then you leave, you know, or you're going to get arrested. So uh, every Whoa. once in a while, you'll find a cop that will back up your rights. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen that often. I would say more often than not, they don't back up your rights. But I, I've had it happen a few times. And, um, you know, there are some states that um are worse than others in this regard now uh like like for instance california there's a lot of things wrong with california in, in terms of the politics i mean definitely has a lot of problems but uh one area where california is generally good is on you know free speech and and in specifically uh going out and being able to gather signatures on petitions 
and do uh, voter yeah. registration. So they have some, yeah. re, you know, some court rulings in California that have gone on our way. Some statutes in California that, um, that you know, say that there's a statute right. in California right. that says you can't be trespassed if you're engaging in a constitutionally protected activity. But you know, the problem is that you know, cops don't always follow the law, and so even in California, there's problems. Uh, well, so, but so yeah, I would say, I'm and, sorry. Andy, before before we we move on to that the, the bigger picture stuff here, um, I you touched on something that uh, is is a, a very important issue to me as a libertarian, as you know, relating to the rest of the libertarian community, and that it, it, it's particularly dismaying to me when I see the guy like you out in the trenches getting arrested not ha and doing it, you know, gathering signatures for Libertarian Party candidates to be able to get on the ballot that you get subjected to legal harassment in these arrests and that the party doesn't back you up. And I'm I, I'm I want to be very careful you to you know you never never hate on anybody for inaction. You know, if, if you can't explain it, or you don't know why maybe they're not acting. But it seems to me that it's not just a lack of of organization, that we have the funds, we have the, the capacity to protect our, our frontline troops like yourself when you get in trouble. And it, it would seem to me that there's there's a kind of embarrassment um, that that that's a part of the problem with the Libertarian Party. Of wanting, and I wear a suit as a candidate, and I'm not talking about just the appearance, but you know, wanting to be the oh, I'm I'm an establishment guy too. I'm just like those guys, and and I, oh, we don't have people getting arrested on our team. And there's kind of a desire out of this artificial self consciousness, uh, and I think it's the product of bullying. It's not the product of a real, legit, even PR kind of reason to be self conscious, because I think the reality is when people see that, if the, if the general public knew what we as libertarians have to do to get on the ballot. And I've, I've gathered signatures for my own races before and, and for a, a couple of others. I, I know, I know the challenge. I, I, I'm familiar with this. Um, and, and I've, I, I've been asked to leave places and I've had those kinds of interactions with police where you just sidestep it and, you know, just generally don't get arrested. But I would think that if, if more of the American people knew that, Hey, just operating as a party, doing legal things to challenge the duopoly means you might get you might get arrested. In fact, there's a pretty good chance that eventually you will. That that if they knew that that was part of it, that there'd be a lot more sympathy and understanding of the American people going, well, what is this message that's being suppressed? And now, first of all, there's a lot of obviously for you to respond to in there, but. Do you think that the main reason the LP doesn't back you up is that they're sort of self-conscious of associating with someone who got arrested? Um, that's part of it. I think part of it is also just laziness. And yeah. I also think another part of it is um, that, you know, some of these people, they're not the ones, not all of them, but some of them are not the ones out collecting signatures themselves. So they, they're, they don't know what you're going through. And then another part of it is people are afraid of the state. A lot of people are just afraid to take on the state, you know. Um, now, there was um, in, in the entire history of the Libertarian Party, I'm aware of one Libertarian who actually did file a lawsuit about being run out of a location. And that was a guy um, in Connecticut. Um, his name is Dan Real. He was, I don't know if he still is, but he was the state chair of the LP of Connecticut. He might still be. Mm -hmm. In 2018, himself and a couple other libertarian volunteers, they went to a public festival that was being held at a public park in a place called, I believe it was uh, Meriden, Connecticut. And they, the public, the festival was open to the public to come and go. It was in a public park. There was no admission charge. Anyway, uh, they had every legal right to be there gathering petition signatures. And they were run out of the park under the threat of arrest by the police and um, apparently under the orders of the mayor. And so um, now Dan Real, uh, he is not an attorney, but he's a professional paralegal. Like he's a paralegal. That's his job for what he does for a living. And uh, anyway, he knew how to go about filing all the paperwork for a lawsuit. So he sued them and they won a $37,000 settlement. Mm. And, you know, Dan kept like $5,000 for himself just for the hassle of doing it. 
and uh, they they actually donated the rest of the settlement to the Libertarian Party of Connecticut. So right. after this happened, I thought, well, wow, the the people on the LNC should because I've been talking about this for years. I've been saying for years that libertarians we we could have laws. It, it, basically, on pretty much every time the Libertarian Party does a petition drive anywhere in the country, these type of problems happen uh, just about every time. And uh, I thought, well, now, finally, the people in, in leadership positions, of the Libertarian Party will look at this example and uh, they'll they'll uh, say, hey, we can win these lawsuits. I mean, the, the case law is already on our side. The Constitution's on our side. A lot, there's oftentimes statutes on our side. And but unfortunately, nobody's done anything since then. Now, there is a libertarian in uh, Los Angeles. And I know you know who I'm talking about because I know you've interviewed this guy before. And that's uh, Kevin Shaw. And yeah. uh, he was he was involved in the uh, campus uh, libertarian club. I think it was Young Americans for Liberty, the libertarian club started by Ron Paul. And uh, he was um, out. He wasn't petitioning, but he was out handing out copies of the Constitution and, you know, just talking about liberty and telling people about the Young Americans for Liberty club on the campus, which is perfectly legal activity. He was standing in the public walkways of the campus doing this. And uh, this was at a community college in Los Angeles. I think it was uh, Pierce Pierce College. And um, anyway, they, they, they called the campus cops on him. They told him he couldn't do it. So um, he got help from an organization called The FIRE, which stands for the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. They're kind of like a, they're like a free speech group, but they only deal with college campuses. And um, I, I have contacted the fire myself, but they've told me they will only take your case if you're a student or if you're faculty or you work at the college in some capacity. But since he was a student, they took his case. He sued and he won a fifty thousand dollars settle. Or no, I'm sorry, a two hundred thousand dollars settlement. I don't think he kept all the money. I, some of it went to the a lot of it went to the fire. But uh, anyway, as a result of that court decision. All of the community colleges in Los Angeles County stopped harassing people who were engaging in free speech activities, including, you know, petition signature gathering. So I thought, hey, that would be another example um, of a libertarian, you know, winning one of these cases and that maybe other people in the libertarian party would say, hey, we should start doing this more often. You know, yeah, we, can, really. we, can, we can protect our rights. <laughs> yeah, we can make some money. And um, a lot of times when you get a victory, they, they start they start to back down and they leave you alone in the future because they're like, oh, no, we don't want to get sued again. And so but unfortunately, you know, nobody in the Libertarian Party has uh, has stepped up to do anything. Now, there have been like a few incidents here and there where somebody in the Libertarian Party made some phone calls or maybe a Libertarian attorney threatened to file a lawsuit but um, for the most part, nobody's, you know, nobody's really done much of anything. That's one of the things I'm disappointed about. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I ran for uh, LNC. I did to be on the Libertarian National Committee. But, you know, unfortunately, I didn't didn't get elected. But I've, I've run for the LNC, uh, I guess, was it three times and I've lost all three times. But anyway, yeah, so that one of the reasons I was running um, was because I wanted to try to improve LP ballot access operations. You know, here's another thing Andy, a lot of people don't Andy, understand. Andy, we're gonna we're gonna get you on the LNC in 2022. It was. Well, we'll uh, see. I, I'll, I, I'll see what I'm doing then, but maybe. <laughs> I, I, no, I mean, I I really admire your persistence, not just your commitment to the party and and persistence in what your work and, and contribution to the cause, but specifically in in running for uh, for LNC three times. And I thought, uh, for sure this year that you were going to get it. And I, I really think it was because of, uh, some of the chaos and, and manipulation around the convention because of COVID and, and that nonsense was really probably the only reason. Uh, yeah, that, that also, um, I, I, you know, one thing I didn't like to happen at the convention was they took away speaking time for, uh, LNC, uh, candidates, not, not for chair, not for the, uh, uh chair, yeah. vice chair. But yeah, for the so other you, people, yeah, I, you, didn't I, even, I really yeah, you didn't even, you didn't even have a chance to present your resume to the party in a in a thirty second speaking slot, even in a in a long lineup of of candidates, just to remind people uh, who you are and what you've achieved for the party. So I, yeah, I have no they doubt. They give you like three minutes or something to speak, right. and, and unfortunately, they didn't do that this time. But uh, anyway, you know. One thing a lot of people don't realize, they'll just look at, oh, geez, I have to go out and get all these signatures. Isn't this a pain? And, oh, this is this law is really terrible. And there's a certain element of truth to that. I can understand why people would say that. But it's, it's also a campaign. 
Yes, yes. that is bingo. You can sit the nail on that. A lot of libertarians don't understand that that is a part of the campaign and it gives you an opportunity to go out and you get to talk to the public. And if you're doing a libertarian party petition, you know, uh, a lot of people have never gotten to, to, they might've heard of a libertarian or some people have it. There's still people out there who don't know what it is. Now I will say that um, in the last 10 or 12 years or so, a lot more people know what a libertarian is than who knew, you know, let's say 15 or 20 years ago. But there's still people out there who don't know what it is or have misconceptions about it, or maybe they even do know what it is. In fact, there's a lot of people out there who self-identify as libertarians, but they're not members of the Libertarian Party. Uh, oftentimes, they're not, they're not registered to vote as a libertarian. Maybe they're not even registered to vote at all, or they're registered to vote as something else or as an independent or something like that. But they're actually libertarians. And I, I've run into them a lot while petitioning. In fact, um, uh, several years ago, myself and another libertarian uh, activist petitioner, um, a guy by the name of uh, Jake Whitmer, uh, we came up with a contact list, uh, a contact sheet to carry for people to carry while they were petitioning and that they could get like if you run into somebody who says, yeah, I'm a libertarian or you tell them what a libertarian is or you give them a world's smallest political quiz and they score in the libertarian quadrant asking them, hey, would you like to be on the contact list for the libertarian party? Let's take your information. And uh, our hope was that, um, that, you know, a lot of libertarians would start doing this and we would start bringing in, you know, tens of thousands of contacts for small L libertarians, uh, getting them on the libertarian parties, you know, email list and stuff like that. And uh, unfortunately, it never took off. Nobody else was really doing it. So but I, I can just say personally, I have collected. Oh, a lot. I don't even know how many, but I collected a lot of contacts and I just donated them to free for free to the Libertarian National Committee or to the state parties so, you know, they could add more people to their uh, their, their mailing list. But, you know, here, here's a for instance for you. Yesterday, I'm doing this petition in California right now to repeal the ban on uh, on flavored tobacco, which includes right. uh, vape juice and, and uh, uh, flavored cigarettes and, and uh, um, you know, flavored rolling paper, which is actually used by a lot of marijuana smokers. Yeah. Anyways, it's repealing the law, okay, I ran into a guy yesterday who works at a vape shop. He signed the petition. While I was talking to him, he said he was a libertarian. Uh, but he's never been to a libertarian party meeting, never been to a libertarian party convention, never been, never been, uh, you know, never done anything with the libertarian party, but he self-identified as a libertarian. And uh, while I was, you know, he signed my petition. While I was talking to him, uh, came out in conversation that he actually knew who you were, Adam. And he yeah. was, uh, you know, he's a fan of you. And he said he wished you would have won the presidential nomination. So there's all kinds of people like that out there, you know, and uh, you run, you run into them. So, so the, the petitioning process is a good excuse to go out and talk to people, yeah. uh, uh, talk to people about Liberty, you know, yeah, and, and in some ways it's a better in than the world's smallest political quiz, which is my favorite thing to do tabling when you have that quiz up there and you get to stop people walking by and say, you know, it's a fun, interactive thing you can do. But in a way, hey, I need your signature. Can you help me, please? It's almost like that. There's a there's a, a con where, you know, you convince someone to do you a favor by doing them a favor first or like and and and, and once once they, they feel like they've do, done you a favor by signing your petition because you have a real reason because you're going to. Hey, the government is standing in my way from you know me giving you a choice on this election. Can can you sign this for me, please? And and now they they naturally want to talk to you. And if you're not like just doing the hustle like Andy has to sometimes, high traffic and you know just trying to get thousands and thousands in a hurry. Um, it's it's I can attest to that. It is a really fun way to engage with people. Now we've only got a few minutes left here, Andy. Um, I do want to, you know, get your thoughts on the big picture, and I do want to take some questions from our audience here. Our first one is from our friend Ed Vallejo in the Producers Club. And for those of you who don't know, yes, this is the best way. You can actually talk to me during the show. This is what I'm watching. is like my producer notes. I am watching the Telegram group for the Producers Club while the show is happening. And so if you want to get questions and comments in here for Andy for this conversation, you can put them on YouTube. You can super chat us. Jim will pull those up. But we're going to start with Ed Vallejo here. He writes, hypothetical situation for Adam and Andy. You are on a highway far from the next available gasoline and almost on empty. But the station you are at requires a face covering before they will sell to you. What do you do? And he says in parentheses, I have this problem myself. 
Andy, I know my answer. How would you? How would you answer this question? Well, I just for the sake of expediency, I would probably just put on the face mask just so I could get my gas. But I, I wouldn't be happy about it. But <laughs> sometimes you have to, you know, choose your battles. You know. Yeah. So, so, um, so there. Yeah. I mean, I'm similar to that. There. There. I mean, if it says far from the next available gasoline, almost not empty. How much is almost, and how far is far? Right. You know, because if I can make the statement with 90% confidence that I'll get to the next gas station. I usually have a spare five gallon can in my vehicle. Anyhow, I'll say, you know what, as, as just to, to show you that I'm conscientiously taking my business elsewhere, I will. But if, if I can't say with confidence, I'll make it to the next gas station. I have no problem saying, all right, I will, I will submit to this policy here. And I, I don't want to say coercion because it's not coercive in and of itself. I don't want to play this leftist game of, you know, well, they're forcing you to work to live, and it's like, uh, no. But um, I would, I would put it on, and I guess the other thing you could do is sort of play games with it and do the chin. Well, if I put it over my chin, is that okay? Does that satisfy you for your boss for their requirements? Oh, okay, and then I'd make jokes about it being stupid and symbolic. And if they say no, me personally, I really want. You know, I got a, I got a sick grandma at home, and I would really like you to wear a mask to protect me then of course, you know, I, I would wear it in the seriousness of whatever value it has there that they want. Uh, but I would, I would, I would probably take the opportunity to say, no, um, you know, this is not justified and, and not helpful. Um, but Andy, you know, your answer is simply, yeah, when you got to get somewhere, you got to get somewhere. And if you're trying to get around the country to gather signatures, uh, you just have to weigh even what's the political statement or the value of that conscious consumerism against the, the, the greater mission that you're on. Yeah. Or you could, you know, have the mask up and then pull it, then, then just every few moments, pull it down, you know, <laughs> I'm eating, I'm allowed to pull it down when I'm, when I'm eating. Yeah. Yeah. Or just, I, I guess there's, there's one way to, to never have to wear a mask is just carry a smoothie around and just, sip it every 30 seconds and then you know, I can't wear a mask while eating and drinking, right? That's an exception. Um, all right. So Jim, comment Jim, producer Jim today. Do you have any comments? Can you get some questions or anything up on uh, up on the screen here for, uh, for Andy? Let's see. Uh, oh, Jim, Jim. Well, Jim is commenting on Telegram. Yeah. I, he just said, yeah, like you should, you should be paying attention to the comments here, Jim. But Jim is commenting himself. He writes, if you must wear a mask in this case, you can just be sure to use your freedom of speech to say some shit. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, Jim, do we have what, what do we have for comments or, or questions from the audience uh, for, for Andy here? Let's see. Can we get here we go? Uh, I'm a statist. I normally get called a socialist when folks find out I'm a libertarian. No one has ever been able to tell me how a free market is socialist, but I've also not been able to persuade them otherwise. Andy, you want to speak to that in terms of the, uh, the some of the misconceptions you run into, just actual on the ground, getting the word libertarian in front of your fellow Americans? Oh, you mean you mean from people who don't know what a libertarian is? Um, yeah, yeah I've, I've gotten people. Oh, you mean librarian or something? Uh, you know, <laughs> but um, no, I've had people over the years who thought libertarian was Ralph Nader. They thought libertarian was Ross Perot, Pat Buchanan, uh, Jesse Ventura, Lyndon LaRouche. I've had people who think libertarian means, you know, far left wing liberal or socialist communist. I've had people think libertarian means, you know, uh, uh, ultra conservative, ultra right wing. And so, uh, yeah, there's still a lot of people that don't know what a libertarian is or have, you know, uh, misconceptions about it, or they think that some person who uh, uh, people for a while were saying Bill Maher was a libertarian because Bill Maher at one point was calling himself a libertarian. Now, fortunately, Bill Maher stopped calling himself a libertarian because I, I don't think he ever, I think he was more of a libertine, like a left wing libertine, but not really a libertarian. Yeah. yeah, there were people at one time going around saying that, you know, Bill Maher was a libertarian. And, uh, but, you know, I will say this, like I said, for many years of hard work from the Libertarian Party, and then also especially from people like Ron Paul, uh, using the word libertarian uh, in, in public, you know, in, in uh, like 
in the big media and when Ron Paul ran in the Republican primaries, getting on stage in the Republican debates and, and using the word libertarian and then other people like John Stossel and, and some other, you know, rel- well-known or relatively well-known uh, media talking heads have used the word. Um, the libertarian, the word libertarian is now more known and more popular than it's ever been. And there's more people self-identifying as libertarian than ever before. And uh, Libertarian Party voter registrations have been going up in the states where you can register by party. Um, and it's happening happening mostly organically. Uh, the Libertarian Party's done maybe two or three paid voter registration drives here and there. But the majority of it has been just more people checking the Libertarian box on their, uh, on their voter registration form. And uh, so uh, unfortunately, though, this has not translated into membership growth for the Libertarian Party. So, and that's one of the big problems. That's another reason why I was I was uh, running for the LNC because um, if we could get even a small percentage, of, let's say we got like five percent or ten percent of the self-identified libertarians out there who are not members of the Libertarian Party to join the party, the party yeah. would be much larger than it is right now. Yeah, have a lot more members, there, there, there's so some people. There's some people in the party who take the position, well, we're not a membership organization. We're a political party. The job is to get votes. And we don't care so much if people join as long as they vote and donate and, and run for office, even if not joining at first. But that's it's very short sighted and, and, and playing their game. I think for the Libertarian Party, when we get people to join, they're, they're joining an organization that is the centerpiece of a bigger movement. And they're getting a definition and a community. And and I, I, I'm I very suspicious of people who say that we should have a non-membership based model for the LP or people who, who uh, you know, hinder those efforts. All right, Jim, we got time for at least one more question, comment here. Mark Jason Walker writes that, Andy, the cops that arrested you in Maryland were tools, weren't they? Good question. Good question. Yeah, no, and it sounds like in that case, Andy, yeah. go back. You didn't really get arrested for petitioning. You got arrested for failing to be Im- immediately obedient. Well, yeah. And then also because it, in the case of Maryland, I wanted to record them uh, uh, telling me to leave because, um, right. you know, like a day, or, a day or two or so before that happened, another petitioner was working in the same county and he got ran off a community college and they actually gave it to him in writing that he had to leave the community college. So I thought, well, I should get something in writing as well. And, yeah. you know, but they wouldn't give me anything in writing. And I tried to record them. And that's when they, uh, they, you know, they, they grabbed me and sprayed mace in my eyes and, you know, cuffed me and took me off to jail. But, uh, anyway, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of cops are jerks. So like I said, every once in a while, you'll, you'll have one that will back up your rights and, you know, it's, it, it happens more likely in some states than others that they'll back up your rights, but every once in a while they do. But most of the time they don't. You know, most right. of the time. They do not. Andy, we just have a couple of minutes here. I want to get to one more comment here. Girl from South, as a longtime registered no party voter who votes libertarian, I like not being associated with no party. But after seeing this, I may take the plunge. That's that's a great comment. Thank you, and 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 I, I'm I'm appreciative that there are a lot of people in our audience, uh, with Adam versus the man in that position, who are who actually do understand libertarianism, but are, are just have certain reluctances to uh, to being involved with the party. And I've always said, you know, run a paper campaign even, and and use it as an excuse as an activist to just get out there and and speak your message for free in ways that would normally cost you a lot of money. Just to, you know, punk the system. Even if, if you start even with just that and, and you, you respect the Libertarian Party message of, of ethics and the platform, you're more than welcome. And people like Andy might even help you get signatures to get on the ballot if that's necessary for your campaign. In most, it's not. All you gotta do is you know, sign up or give them a couple hundred bucks. But Andy, what would you say to those people in our movement who are absolutely hardcore get the message libertarians but have have some reluctance to being more involved with the party well i can understand you know um you know some people just don't want to join something or they like to be registered as a as an independent or nonpartisan. and like i said half the states don't register by party so everybody in in like let's say washington or virginia um they don't or indiana they don't register by party in those states they're every you know but uh, other the other half of the states approximately you know you do register by party and i'm pretty sure south dakota does register by party 
Um, so, um, you know, by registering as a libertarian in some states, you can help keep the party on the ballot because in yeah. some states they'll determine ballot access by how many registered voters you have. And so um, it, it helps with that. Now, as far as joining the party, um, it helps with uh, uh, candidates uh, getting not only getting ballot access, but getting some kind of support network. Because if you're a member of the Libertarian Party, you know, you'll have a support network of other Libertarian Party members all over the country. And yep. if you're trying to go it alone as an independent, um, it's a lot harder to do that. So, uh, and, you know, for those out there who are not happy with some things the Libertarian Party is doing, well, my question to you is, did you show up at the convention? Did you show up yeah, at a meeting? Because yeah, you can't, yeah. you know, you can sit there on the sidelines, but you, if, you, if you're not happy with something the party's doing, then uh, get involved and do something about it. The way I've said it is I've yet to hear a single complaint about the Libertarian Party, even that you didn't like the nominee for president that couldn't be changed by the person complaining showing up and doing something about it because even even this year the difference between uh the, the top two or the final two uh presidential candidates for the libertarian primary it was really close you could have pushed it one way or another with one person's effort that way and there's so many other things you know and i, I most of the, the complaints about the lp honestly they're bullshit excuses for sitting on the sidelines or they're troll comments that don't make any sense like people who are saying well i can't vote for jorgensen because she wants, she was too friendly with Black Lives Matter. And you go, as opposed to being friendly with the bankers and the military industrial complex and all the pedophiles in government and every other, so, you know, everybody else in the deep state, really, you have a problem with her being friendly with, and it's like, no, 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 that's, you're revealing that you just, you, you, you got some, something else going on. And I, I think there are a lot of trolls who take that position to be critical and and keep people away. This is the modern version of COINTELPRO and with social media trolling. Uh, but it, it's also uh, people giving into a temptation to sit on the sidelines. And I won't sit here and say you have a duty or a responsibility or an obligation to join the Libertarian Party and be that get them signatures gathered in the rain libertarian like mm -hmm. Andy here but uh don't don't be sitting on the sidelines and don't let petty excuses stop you from jumping in and if anything the libertarian party pro provides you just by membership showing up to county meetings if that's all you want to do a very easy on-ramp to more meaningful and satisfying activism like andy has found in his vein as i think our our best resident ballot access and signature gathering expert andy also has a YouTube channel, Libertarian Revolution. We'll include the link in the notes there. I think Jim can pull it up so you can see it on screen. Oh, there it is. Um, yes, okay, please. Yeah, yeah, check out my channel. Anything else? Oh, yeah, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but um, on my uh, – am I back on camera? Yes, you are. Oh, okay. I was going to say uh, my uh, – on my shirt, I've still got the freedom pin that you gave me at the LP of California convention. So, you know, I forgot it was on the shirt. And one day I had his shirt in the laundry and I pulled it. This is some metal thing. I was going to take it off. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. That's my freedom pin. So I've kept it. It's been on my, it's been on this shirt is since uh, I, I last saw you at the uh, Libertarian Party California State Convention uh, back in uh, February of this year. So, <laughs> so it's kind of fun. I forgot it was on there, and it's still there. So yeah, I'm still, I figured I should wear this. Uh, for It would be appropriate for the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy. If someone wants to, to get in touch with you uh, directly, uh, email, phone, what, what, what what's the best way? If someone wants to I, – I imagine there are going to be some people who watch this who have follow-up questions. How do I get started doing what Andy's doing? How do I find my own way in? Um, so what's the best way for people to get uh, Send me an email at uh, libertarianrevolution at protonmail.com. Libertarianrevolution at protonmail.com. There you and, go. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, for those of you, if you, uh, one thing I've said is, like, if you're a libertarian and you live in a state that has an initiative or referendum process, and there is a pro-liberty, you know, ballot initiative or referendum or, or a recall where you can remove a politician from office with a recall petition and uh, go out and get some signatures on it because it's a good opportunity to talk to the public. 
And it's a good opportunity to hand out, you know, Libertarian Party pamphlets, flyers, whatever, get contact information from people. And uh, you can also get paid to do it. I mean, there's groups uh, like the thing here in California. You can you could go get paid to talk to people about a pro-liberty issue and uh, help get it on the ballot. And you can help build the Libertarian Party at the same time. And, uh, you know, we need to have more Libertarians out out doing doing this type of stuff, because, frankly, there aren't that many. Uh, most of the people out, you know, gathering signatures are not libertarians. So uh, it's a good way to get out and talk to the public and uh, help, you know, spread a message and, and build a movement. Heck yeah. Thank you so much. And you for can get paid at the same time, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, of course, you can do it as a volunteer, too. But I'm just saying if, if you, you have financial concerns, uh, you can, you know, you can you can make some money at the same time and you can get paid for your activism. Basically, you get paid to go out and talk to people about liberty. That's the dream. Yeah. So, right. um, thanks anything so else? All right. All right. Thanks, thanks so much for your time today. Okay. All right. All appreciate right. it. We'll stay in touch.